I'm coming to you from the 2017 American Society of Hematology meeting in Atlanta, Georgia. And at this meeting we saw uh, some very nice results from several uh, large randomized trials in low-grade lymphomas as well as uh, some updated results from a couple early phase trials also in low-grade lymphomas. Uh, I think probably one of the uh, most interesting things that we saw was the follow-up of a couple different randomized trials looking at the utilization of rituximab maintenance or abinutuzumab maintenance following bendamustine containing regimens. Uh, one of those trials was done by the Steele group. This is the German low-grade lymphoma group by Matthias Rommel and his colleagues. And in this trial, they were exploring rituximab maintenance, two types of schedules, following bendamustine and rituximab induction. And essentially, they gave all patients bendamustine and rituximab. One arm got two years of maintenance rituximab. The other arm uh, got four years of maintenance rituximab. And it showed that there was a prolongation in progression-free survival with four years of rituximab maintenance compared to two years. No real difference in overall survival that we know of and didn't appear to be dramatically increased toxicity uh, compared to earlier trials with uh, bendamustine as uh, with rituximab without maintenance therapy. We also saw a subset analysis from the BRIGHT trial. This was a randomized trial of RCHOP or RCVP versus bendamustine rituximab. And in this subset analysis, they looked at patients who received rituximab maintenance following bendamustine rituximab or RCHOP. And in this trial, it also looked like there was a prolongation of progression-free survival in patients who received rituximab maintenance. And the, fall, the final trial was the results of the cooperative group trial known as the Bionic trial. And that trial looked at uh, basically three different regimens as induction, bendamustine rituximab, bendamustine velcade rituximab, or another arm with bendamustine rituximab. And what they did, uh, one arm got bendamustine rituximab followed by rituximab maintenance, the other got bendamustine velcade rituximab followed by rituximab maintenance following, but the last arm had bendamustine rituximab followed by lenalidomide rituximab. Out of all that, uh, what we found is that bendamustine and rituximab maintenance had the same progression-free survival as the other two arms. In other words, using lenalidomide and rituximab maintenance or bendamustine velcade in the front line didn't appear to be any better at controlling the disease long term than this BR followed by our maintenance. One of the things uh, that I think a lot of us were looking for was safety in using rituximab maintenance following a bendamustine containing induction regimen. And at least in these tr three trials, there didn't appear to be a strong safety signal in the rituximab maintenance arm. So I think that that, again, was very informative for those of us that are looking at using these drugs in practice, uh, that at least in three randomized studies didn't appear to be a lot of excess toxicity uh, following bendamustine uh, with maintenance therapy. Um, we, also thought, uh, at this, we also saw at this meeting uh, some interesting results uh, using pembrolizumab as a single agent in low-grain lymphomas. Unfortunately, only 9% overall response rate, but when you combine pembrolizumab with rituximab, my colleague Loretta Nastapil showed that the response rate was up dramatically. This was in patients with relapsed follicular lymphomas. Overall response rate over 60% with a complete remission rate of over 50%. So I think you know, there may be some synergy with the combination of the two uh, in low-grade lymphomas. And finally, uh, we also saw some interesting uh, follow-up data uh, in patients that expo were exposed to PIA3 kinase inhibitors um, yeah, in, with low-grade lymphomas. And this came from uh, basically data that was accumulated across different trials uh, in patients that received the PIA3 kinase inhibitor umbrilizumab. And in these, uh, this analysis of several patients, uh, over 300 patients followed at a medium of almost six months, there didn't appear to be significant colitis or transaminitis. And I think um, for the class of drugs, this was quite important because this is often the side effects that we encounter with similar agents. So if there is a PI3 kinase inhibitor that has activity in low-grade lymphomas that does not have uh, a significant side effect profile, uh, that's very impactful.